Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so um, I am Simone. I am a postdoc in uh, Mark Robinson's lab in uh, in Zurich, and um, I am a statistician. So I develop statistical methods uh, in general in computational biology and in particular in bioinformatics. Uh, so this one is uh, called differential regulation. It's um, a method for single cell organistic data, uh, which uh, we've actually done jo jointly with a bunch of people from Mark, Mark's lab, but also Rob Pacho's lab. Now, the method intuitively studies regulation from single cell organistic data. And um, just as a bit of background, uh, from this kind of data, you can't separate the abundance of spliced and unspliced reads. And this is, for instance, used by RNA velocity tools to study the derivative of the spliced mRNA over time. And the basic assumption here uh, is that the ratio between the unspliced and the spliced, if it's higher than you would expect at the equilibrium, uh, then this suggests that a gene is probably being upregulated because this large spliced um, amount is going to get spliced and it's going to increase the mature mRNA. Uh, while if this is lower than you would expect the, at the equilibrium, the gene is probably being downregulated because the newly spliced mRNA is not going to fully compensate the degraded uh, mRNA. And so the, in the near future term, um, the spliced mRNA is going to go, uh, is going to decrease. So we take uh, basically this assumption and we try to bring it, if you like, a step further, and we use it to compare uh, experimental conditions. Uh, like development time points or things like that. And so what we assume is that if you have, in a condition, a higher relative abundance of unspliced mRNA, when this suggests that this condition is going to be, uh, the gene in this condition is going to be upregulated compared to the other condition, uh, because this larger amount of unspliced mRNA is going to be spliced and increase the uh, mature mRNA more than it's going to happen in the other condition. And obviously, conversely, if this uh, relative abundance is lower. Um, and so mathematically, the way we identify these genes is by simply uh, not relying on all the assumptions of any velocity tools, but by simply looking at the relative abundance of uh, unspliced reads and looking for changes in this uh, relative abundance. Now, since we have single cell organistic data, we can, of course, uh, cluster sets before we do the analysis uh, so that we identify cell cluster or cell type specific changes in regulation. Now, just keep in mind that this is very different from uh, differential gene expression studies, uh, because there you would look for changes in the total abundance of uh, splice reads. Here, we don't really care about the total abundance of splice reads. We just look for differences in the relative abundance of our splice reads. So the idea is that you look for differences in the near future change, so in the direction that the spliced mRNA is taking, regardless of its total abundance. Uh, and so here it's an example of the kind of output of like a gene that we identify. Uh, here we compare three and six month uh, brain organoids. Uh, and you can see that at six months, uh, this particular gene, in this particular cell type has a higher proportion of unspliced reads. And so we would conclude here that it's being upregulated uh, compared to the other condition. And again, it's not an absolute up or down regulation. It's always a comparison between, uh, between two conditions. So getting a little bit into more the uh, kind of uh, mathematical and statistical aspects, uh, what well, the kind of inputs you could use are estimated splice reads that you can easily obtain with um, pseudo aligners like Alevin, Alevin Pry, Callisto bus tools. Uh, but from droplet protocols, there is a large amount of um, uncertainty in the assignment of reads. Uh, so there are so-called multi-mapping reads that can map, first of all, to multiple genes, uh, and secondly, to the two spliced and unspliced versions of each gene. And so we call these later reads uh, ambiguous between S and U. So, of course, you can still use these estimates, but if you neglect the uncertainty in these estimates, your inference is going to be affected. And so, what we try to do to account for this uncertainty is to do two different things. So for the reads compatible with multiple genes, we use a latent variable approach. So this basically means that um, we sample the gene allocation of, uh, of reads. Um, and so this is just treated as, a, as an unknown parameter. 
Now, for the ambiguous reads, my idea was to originally do the same, but in order to use a latent variable approach, basically assign these ambiguous reads to the spliced or unspliced versions, uh, you need to have an estimate of the probability that the ambiguous reads are spliced or unspliced. And that is actually non trivial to obtain. Um, and so instead, we decided to treat these ambiguous reads separately. So instead of working with a bivariate vector, which is what happens in biology, obviously, spliced and unspliced reads, we work with a trivariate vector where you have spliced, unspliced, but also ambiguous reads, which are treated separately. And so we have basically two models a multinomial for the relative abundance of genes. Uh, which we're not interested, we're not really interested in. It's a nuisance model, basically, uh, that is useful for this uh, latent variable approach of the reads compatible with multiple genes. And then we have a hierarchical Dirichlet multinomial approach model, uh, which is the one we're really interested in for the relative abundance of splice and unsplice reads. Now, here I said we compare experimental conditions, but obviously we need biological replicates, so we compare multiple samples in each condition. Uh, and so we embed them in a Bayesian hierarchical model so that each sample has its own uh, um, specific parameters because we account for the uh, biological variability between replicates. But at the same time, there is sharing of information across them. And inferentially, I don't go into details, but we use MCMC uh, schemes where we basically alternately sample from the conditional distributions of the parameters given the latent states and then the latent states given the parameters. We've done benchmarks against uh, a couple of methods, which are the ones at least I identified that do this kind of analysis. That are AZA, which is based on EJA, and we 2 which is another Bayesian method. Uh, but the key point here is that they ignore this mapping uncertainty, which I mentioned. And so we've done benchmarks on real data, which I'm not going to show, and in simulations where we, we use a real data set as an anchor. So we have four samples that basically belong to the same, um, same experimental condition, and we split them into two groups, and we artificially introduce a differential effect into one of the two groups. So it's actually effectively a semi-simulated data set. Um, and we run two simulations, one where we only introduce a it's called differential regulation effect, and one where we also introduce a differential gene expression effect. And the idea is that this is a nuisance effect that we don't want to detect. And obviously, it's going to make our life harder when detecting differential regulation without detecting differential gene expression. Um, and then, as I said, the key, the key point of the study is that we want to deal properly mathematically with mapping uncertainty. And so we obviously have to introduce it in the simulation. And we do it with MinNo, which is a, a read level simulator from Rob Patrick's group. So here are the key plots from the simulation. So you have true positive rate and versus false discovery rate. So if you're not familiar for this, you basically want to be, you know, on the top left area, you know, high true positive discoveries and few false discoveries. Um, now, without going too much into details, our method is in green. You see it as it doesn't manage to really get uh, a very high true positive rate. I think this is because of the simulation itself, but relative to the other methods, there's higher true positive rate um, and also controls for the false discovery rate. Uh, a little bit less for all the methods when you introduce differential gene expression that you see a little bit it alters the results. So uh, wrapping up things, I don't really know how, oh yeah, I think I'm doing fine with time. Wrapping up, um, we haven't really proposed a new analysis. Um, as you've seen, there are tools that do this, but our idea is to have a more if you like, sophisticated mathematical approach that can lead to better performance because we account for the uh, for the, for the uncertainty in the mapping of droplet reads. Obviously, this comes at mostly a computational cost because you have a more complex model to optimize. But we actually, I haven't spoken about this, but we actually have two versions available. The more, if you like, complex version, but also a faster one, uh, which doesn't do the gene uh, allocation, which is slightly less accurate, but it's also faster. Uh, covariates are also not modeled because it's not very easy to include them in this kind of uh, model. Um, and we're currently working uh, on an extension of this um, to also work on bulk data, where my idea would basically have two kinds of analysis at different resolutions, where on single cell data, you can identify uh, changes at the gene level, but which are cell type specific, as we've said, because you can cluster cells. On bulk data, obviously, you cannot have cell type specific changes. But at the same time, you can have transcript level changes, 
because on bulk data you can actually distinguish uh, the transcripts uh, of each gene. And so you, you could study things at different resolutions on the two data sets. Um, the package is, is already available on, on Bar Conductor. And after we've done this extension, uh, uh, we'll write a preprint. So hopefully, I think by September, October, uh, we'll also have a description out. OK, thank you. Thank you very much for your, for your attention. So we do have uh, at least one question. Um, we're coming to the end of the, uh, the session here. So we do have at least one question for you, uh, Dr. Tiberi, uh, from Ryan Thompson. In the past, I've simply run Salmon or Callisto on the reads while including the unspliced transcript sequences in the reference and just let the EM algorithm sort out the ambiguous reads in the same ways for alternative splicing. How does your method compare to this approach to splice ambiguous reads. So I guess what's the marginal benefit of properly moderate modeling with a hierarchical model? Oh, I, I, need, I need a minute to reread that. Not that fast. Um, I some place in the reads when including the splice transcripts. Well, I mean, that's kind of shown um, in the plots, if you like. Um, I think. Not sure. Yeah, I think the question was maybe before I mentioned the other two methods. So that's basically what the other two methods do, right? Because they um, they take these this, uh, EM estimates and they deal with them. Uh, so they're not these estimates are not wrong. Uh, they're accurate, but there's uncertainty in them. They're estimates. So the other methods just treat them as if they were real values. They neglect the uncertainty, and you can see that this uh, in, as impacts on the on the inference. So I guess I'll follow up a little bit on that. Suppose that you did. Uh, suppose that you applied the bootstrapping estimates from, say, a Callisto run or a uh, an uh, eleven run. Um, how does that compare to properly properly hierarchically modeling the uncertainty therein? Well, I mean, I mean that would be another way to do that. I mean, uh, this is not the only way you can, of course, uh, deal with the uncertainty in this multi mapping width. You could use those bootstrap estimates. But then, of course, you also need a mathematical model to somehow, you know, mathematically correctly model the uncertainty via the bootstrap estimates. So that is our approach because I, I feel it for me, obviously, from my background, that is the most natural approach for me. But of course, you could develop something that started from those bootstrap estimates. Yeah. So I guess then the yet further um, will there be a, a comparison of, say, sleuth and uh, um, differential. Um, Sorry, differential regulation in the preprint. Um, I haven't, so I don't remember very much details. Does Lut um, that's Lut that because Lut that's differential alternative splicing, I guess? Uh, yeah. Yes, this was transcript usage. Mm -hmm, yeah. Uh, yeah, I would have to think about it. Yeah, if, if, if it's possible to apply it to this kind of framework, yes. Cool. Uh, although, although I'm not sure because in the end it would be an extension, right? Because that one is for bulk RNA seq. This is a bit different features, but yes, of course, I'll think about it. If it's possible, yeah, we'll add it. Very cool. Thank you for a lovely talk. Yeah, um, yeah. Thanks for your for your questions. Do you have any further in-person questions? Leo. Um, hi. Um, Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, this is a question for Stefano. Oh, here. Um, so uh, I was interested by your method for detecting outliers, and it seems that it makes the assumption that uh, the data is going to be unimodal. Um, could it maybe also help you identify droplets in some cases? Or um, are you concerned that maybe um, you could be actually throwing away things that you actually want to keep? Uh, Yes. Um, yeah, so uh, for sure it's a unimodal model. And uh, we identify in some data sets, for example, this bimodality, it's captured as outlier. But um, I mean, the estimates are for the user to judge. So in some case where we have a huge presence of outliers for many cell types, is probably the indication that you by missing some covariates or your model should be complex my explaining those. So the concept is 
in some cases, you have just single outliers that you know investigating you might be fine that what they are, and in other cases you have to you to to judge and to run iteratively your model to explain those bimodality. Yeah, definitely it's not a bimodal model in the sense, uh, but it's good that probabilistically you the model identifies for you that those are outliers uh, according with your model. Good. Hi, uh, this is for Simon. Uh, great talk, uh, especially the idea of using uh, the uncertainty in the read mapping is pretty interesting. So I was wondering, uh, the A category which you're talking, which was ambiguous reads, right? Uh, is there any inherent bias or have you, have you seen any correlation of the A reads comparative to the, let's say, length of the gene? So, or uh, let's say number of number of uh, intron or number of exons in that specific genes. Because if there is a correlation, then certain group of genes would have more uh, uncertainty and eventually it will make the differential analysis more complicated, right? So is there, do you have any sense of like, is there any correlation or certain group of genes are affected by this relatively more than other group of genes? Thank you. Hi, yeah, thanks. Um, it's a good question, very good. Um, I don't know, I haven't looked it up, uh, but it is, what you say is a bit connected to what I said, that, um, you know, the probability that an ambiguous reads is splice on a splice, it's very hard to estimate because coverage is non-uniform. It, 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 in the end, it's gene specific, it's even transcript specific um, because depending even like, even within the same gene, depending on uh, on alternative splicing, that is going to affect this, and so that's why we actually decided to to keep it separate, uh, because it would be very messy to uh, to get a good estimate of that, which ultimately I think would depend on many of the things that you mentioned. You you satisfied with the answer? Yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. I don't see from the camera. It's okay. <laughs> uh, I have a question for Simone. Uh, so you, you kind of mentioned that, oh, you know, you can cluster the cells and do whatever, but do you do that clustering on just the splice reads, the unsplice reads, both combine? Because I know 10X Genomics is now making default in their cell ranger, just, oh, just count everything. It doesn't matter. It's better to count them all together. Uh, yes. So I thought about that. Um, so we... We tend to use the splice because it's a little bit more coherent with what is normally done. Normally, you you would basically do, uh, you, you know, you would basically cluster based on counts and counts in the end are better reflected probably by spliced only. Um, but yeah, I think you could use whatever you want in the end. Uh, what I, I normally use spliced, uh, but I think that is a little bit, if you like, a prerequisite, let's put it that way. Of the package, it's not something we do. Um, so I would use plies, but you, know, you could also use I don't know the summation of the two if it makes more sense. Um, hi, this is a question for Gabriel. If he's still here, is he there? Yes, thanks. Right. Sure. Cool. Um, so I found your talk really interesting, and you're talking about a method that is capable of analyzing a very large single nucleus RNA-seq data set, at the same time being faster, um, less memory intensive, and using linear mixed models, uh, linear mixed effect models. So um, I feel like you're taking advantage of a lot of pseudo bulking you know, in order to be able to make the single nucleus RNA-seq look like bulk. Um, but is there a trade-off at some point of like how many cell types you can look at? Because maybe uh, once you start to have a lot of um, small cell types, then your pseudo bulk data set will still be pretty large. And maybe that will impact the performance of your method. I don't know. Yeah, that's something we've thought a lot about in terms of it's going to be a trade-off. Power to do differential expression in bulk and pseudo bulk and um, is impacted by the read depth. And when you 
uh, get increased resolution in your cell types, you're going to be losing some of the read depth there, right? Because you're you're splitting your your reads across multiple cell type clusters, and so it's a balance between having say ten cell clusters with very large read depth versus um, uh, versus fifty cell types with lower read depth. And I think it really depends on the data set and and we're looking we're looking at this empirically. Um, but one of the reasons that uh, the, the the computational efficiency is is so important is when you want to explore the pseudobulk at these multiple different resolutions, if it takes you a special machine twelve hours, then it you know it's then it takes that much longer to uh, to to get the, the the downstream analyses. So I I think it really depends on the the biology, um, and yeah, we'll we'll see. I have a question to Stefano. Uh, yeah, it is great talk. Oh, I I'm more interested in the combining the different data types that you showed in the early slides slide. So maybe those can you map and then aggregating the different information from the DNA, RNA, and protein. So how do you combine those uh, kind of data types together? Yes, yeah, so the the method doesn't deal with that. It's just downstream all, of all that. So the method um, assumes you have given uh, identities of, of uh, clusters of cells. So it means that you look into each data separate independently? <laughs> no, no. I, basically, it's very simple. It's just the, the input data is just counts of cells per cluster then how you derive that is all upstream of the method. So focus is just on the statistics of that problem. But do you have any kind of uh, the method or that you develop to combine different data types together or? Uh... Not me, but there are plenty of people here uh, which you know, <laughs> someone speak before. So yeah, you can find your uh, you. knowledge in this graph. Sort of a, a public service announcement. There we go. Kind of a public service announcement. There's a tremendous amount of interest and follow up uh, in this session. So at the same time, we have uh, only ten minutes till uh, the uh, till the Brahma Mukherjee's uh, keynote and the Cure Auditorium. So, to the extent that uh, that we can take this offline or keep a record of it in the uh, in the WebEx sections, that would be wonderful. Thank you all for three wonderful talks and a tremendous amount of stimulating discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much.